We are responsible for some things, while there are others for which we cannot be held responsible. The former include our judgment, our impulse, our desire, aversion, and our mental faculties in general. The latter include the body, material possessions, our reputation, status. In a word, anything not in our power to control. The former are naturally free, unconstrained, and unimpeded while the latter are frail, inferior, subject to restraint, and none of our affair. Remember that if you mistake what is naturally inferior for what is sovereign and free, and what is not your business for your own, you'll meet with disappointment, grief, and worry, and be at odds with God and man. But if you have the right idea about what really belongs to you, and what does not, you will never be subject to force or hindrance. You will never blame or criticize anyone, and everything you do will be done willingly. You won't have a single rival, no one to hurt you, because you will be proof against harm of any kind. With rewards this substantial, be aware that a casual effort is not sufficient. Other ambitions will have to be sacrificed, altogether, or at least for now. If you want these rewards at the same time that you are striving for power and riches, chances are you will not get to be rich and powerful while you aim for the other goal and the rewards of freedom and happiness will elude you altogether. So make a practice at once of saying to every strong impression, An impression is all you are, not the source of the impression. Then test and assess it with your criteria, but one primarily. Ask, is this something that is or is not in my control? And if it's not one of the things that you control, be ready with the reaction, then it's none of my concern. The faculty of desire purports to aim at securing what you want, while aversion purports to shield you from what you don't. If you fail in your desire, you are unfortunate. If you experience what you would rather avoid, you are unhappy. So direct aversion only towards things that are under your control and alien to your nature, and you will not fall victim to any of the things that you dislike. But if your resentment is directed at illness, death, or poverty, you are headed for disappointment. Remove it from anything not in our power to control, and direct it instead towards things contrary to our nature that we do control. As for desire, suspend it completely for now, because if you desire something outside your control, you are bound to be disappointed, and even things we do control, which under other circumstances would be deserving of our desire, are not yet within our power to attain. Restrict yourself to choice and refusal, and exercise them carefully, with discipline and detachment. In the case of particular things that delight you, or benefit you, or to which you have grown attached, remind yourself of what they are. Start with things of little value. If it is china you like, for instance, say, I am fond of a piece of china. When it breaks, then you won't be as disconcerted. When giving your wife or child a kiss, repeat to yourself, I am kissing a mortal, then you won't be so distraught if they are taken from you. Whenever planning an action, mentally rehearse what the plan entails. If you are heading out to bathe, picture to yourself the typical scene at the bathhouse, people splashing, pushing, yelling, and pinching your clothes. You will complete the act with more composure if you say at the outset, I want a bath, but at the same time I want to keep my will aligned with nature. Do it with every act. That way, if something occurs to spoil your bath, you will have ready the thought, well, this was not my only intention, but I also meant to keep my will in line with nature, which is impossible if I go all to pieces whenever anything bad happens. It is not events that disturb people, it is their judgments concerning them. Death, for example, is nothing frightening, otherwise it would have frightened Socrates. But the judgment that death is frightening, now that is something to be afraid of. So when we are frustrated, angry, or unhappy, never hold anyone except ourselves, that is, our judgments, accountable. An ignorant person is inclined to blame others for his own misfortune. To blame oneself is proof of progress. But the wise man never has to blame another or himself. Don't pride yourself on any assets but your own. We could put up with a horse if it bragged of its beauty. But don't you see that when you boast of having a beautiful horse, you are taking credit for the horse's traits? What quality belongs to you? The intelligent use of impressions. If you use impressions as nature prescribes, go ahead and indulge your pride, because then you will be celebrating a quality distinctly your own. 
Don't hope that events will turn out the way you want. Welcome events in whichever way they happen. This is the path to peace. Sickness is a problem for the body, not the mind. Unless the mind decides that it is a problem. Lameness, too, is the body's problem, not the mind's. Say this to yourself, whatever the circumstance, and you will find without fail that the problem pertains to something else, not to you. For every challenge, remember the resources you have within you to cope with it. Provoked by the sight of a handsome man or a beautiful woman, you will discover within you the contrary power of self-restraint. Faced with pain, you will discover the power of endurance. If you are insulted, you will discover patience. In time, you will grow to be confident that there is not a single impression that you will not have the moral means to tolerate. Under no circumstances ever say, I have lost something, only I returned it. Did a child of yours die? No, it was returned. Your wife died? No, she was returned. My land was confiscated? No, it too was returned. But the person who took it was a thief. Why concern yourself with the means by which the original giver effects its return? As long as he entrusts it to you, look after it as something yours to enjoy only for a time, the way a traveler regards a hotel. If you want to make progress, drop reflections like, I will end up destitute if I don't take better care of my affairs, or, unless I discipline my slave, he'll wind up good for nothing. It is better to die of hunger free of grief and apprehension than to live affluent and uneasy. Better that your slave should be bad than you should be unhappy. For that reason, starting with things of little value, a bit of spilled oil, a little stolen wine, repeat to yourself. For such a small price I buy tranquility and peace of mind, but nothing is completely free. So when you call your slave, be prepared for the possibility that he might ignore you, or if he does answer, that he won't do what he's told. He is not worth entrusting with your peace of mind. If you want to make progress, put up with being perceived as ignorant or naive in worldly matters. Don't aspire to a reputation for sagacity. If you do impress others as somebody, don't altogether believe it. You have to realize, it isn't easy to keep your will in agreement with nature, as well as externals. Caring about the one inevitably means you are going to shortchange the other. You are a fool to want your children, wife, or friends to be immortal. It calls for powers beyond you, and gifts not yours to either own or give. It is equally naive to ask that your slave be honest. It amounts to asking that vice be not vice, but something different. You can, however, avoid meeting with disappointment in your desires. Focus on this, then since it is in the scope of your capacities. We are at the mercy of whoever wields authority over the things we either desire or detest. If you would be free then, do not wish to have or avoid things that other people control, because then you must serve as their slave. Remember to act always as if you were at a symposium. When the food or drink comes around, reach out and take some politely. If it passes you by, don't try pulling it back. And if it has not reached you yet, don't let your desire run ahead of you. Be patient until your turn comes. Adopt a similar attitude with regard to children, wife, wealth and status, and in time, you will be entitled to dine with the gods. Go further and decline these goods even when they are on offer, and you will have a share in the gods' power as well as their company. That is how Diogenes, Heraclitus, and philosophers like them came to be called and considered divine.